Hi folks, I'm Rich Folly, and you've been with us all day at the Miami Book Fair 2016 on PBS Bookview Now. Thanks for joining us. It's wonderful to have Ridley Pearson. Folly, Folly, with us. Folly. Yeah, man, it's so great to see you again. Same here. Last year we sat on this couch. You were with me for a full hour as one of we my did. guests. We <laughs> did. Yeah. It was a great time. It was very relaxed. So when I was young, my mother beat me severely with rubber bands. And, no, I'm actually, actually it fine. didn't feel like that at all. I felt like I was me on the, on the couch you know, <laughs> listening to you. But um, what How's I love everything? Was, it's been very good. Good. It's been very good. And good. things keep growing for us here at PBS Bookview now. And what's cool is that we get to talk to you often about the two sides of your writing life. I mean, today you're here on our Young Readers Day. So, of course, we're going to talk about your new book, Are Rock you saying I'm schizophrenic? Not at all. Is that what I you're saying? That, I think that you're Should able I lie to, back down on the you couch? You have a very enviable position of being able to walk two worlds <laughs> at the same time. I really we'll talk about. I am just filled with blessings. Yeah, but yep. The first one, Lock and Key, The Initiation, which I want to talk about in just yes. a sec, is really okay. good. But before that, uh, your other one is White Bone, which uh, is a new, on your adult side. Dear to my heart, yes. Right, and which I also want to talk a little bit about. Great, I'd love they're, to. They're both really interesting. Lock and Key, though, is really fun. I, I felt like as I was reading this that I had a little bit of Hogwarts, a little bit of a oh, totally good. different world. It was, uh, you know. That's a, it, it's set in a boarding school where I went. Really? So it was really just relating a lot of experiences that I'd had, including the tunnels and all of that. Oh, it's, it's, it was an amazing yeah. story. So, so it's the story is obviously Sherlock Holmes. Um, as yeah, a young James kid Moriarty. And right. James Mori Moriarty. They're roommates. Yes. At this and it's really James's descent into criminality. Right. And it's narrated. Well, first yeah. of all, it's at the Baskerville Academy, which, of right. course, is great. And you remember yeah. that. But the interesting thing I thought about this book is that it's, it's, it's narrated by Moira, who is James' yeah, yeah. sister. Yeah, Mariah. And she's 12 oh, years Mariah, old. Sorry. So I got to work from a, from a young girl's point of view. So tell me why you decided to do that, first of all. You You've know, got these two really strong male characters at the center. I and, do. And I, like I had written to... a book, um, gosh, it was quite a while ago now, called The Diary of Ellen Rimbauer. And it was tied into a Stephen King miniseries called Rose Red on ABC. Right. And, um, and we didn't put Stephen's name nor my name on it, and, and it, um, it did very, very well. And it was a blast to write because I wrote from a, the point of view of an 18-year-old girl in 1906, 1908, somewhere in there, and I loved being in that voice. And I haven't had a chance to go back to a female point of view, single point of view, um, for quite a while. Yeah. I do a little bit in white bone, but it's not, a, it's not a first person, it's a third person. And I just, I wanted to try it again because I thought if I was going to write a book about Moriarty, that I wanted to pay an homage to Conan Doyle by having it told, as all the Sherlocks are, from a third point of view, a Watson point of view. Right. And so I had to look around for my Watson. Right. And I thought about a best friend and this and that. And I thought, but then, the, then you really have to explain how could she know this? Because there are going to be scenes where she's not in there. And, um, or the best friend was not in there. And I finally thought, well, if it's his sister, then not only are we in a female point of view, younger sister, I'm the youngest child, believe it or not, and um, watching their brother sort of self-destruct. But uh, I, I would gain all sorts of abilities that I wouldn't otherwise have because she can get to his journals and say, I'm really writing all this third person stuff from having read his journals. Right. So it was just, it was sort of a, was sort of a tool that allowed me to tell the story more easily, yeah. I think. And amazing. I had a blast doing it. Well, and these Still two characters it, so. get on each other's nerves from the get-go. <laughs> well, they're, they're brother and sister. Yeah, well, well, and also, but also Sherlock and Moriarty. Yeah, yeah. They drive each other nuts yeah. from the beginning. Well, I wanted that tension. conflict yeah. to be right from the beginning. It was yeah. right there. And that's yeah. like you're The first on top day they them. meet. Yeah. You know? And you see, yeah. but even though we, this is before Moriarty has taken a turn for the dark side. Yeah, yet, yeah. Yet they're still... There's just something really yeah, quite not some, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and that was what, uh, it was really Harper Collins who came to me and said, would you be interested in doing this? And I said, I would if it, you know, if it was solely Moriarty and, and his story. So for once, I mean, I've written 52 books and they're always a hero arc. 52 you know? books. And yeah. in this one, I was ab I'm able, I'm in the, I've just finished the second book now, I'm starting the third, and I'm able to tell the opposite arc. You know, a boy who starts pretty normal in a pretty unusual family. His family is very wealthy. But over the three book period, we're going to see how it was that he went from pretty normal to a little darker to the greatest 
criminal mind in the world right. that the world's ever I seen. I mean, it's sort of like that's you know, so the Darth fun. Vader story. It is like, kind you know, of, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Sort of transformation of what... Yeah, without the know, futuristic sort of stuff, it is. Sort yeah. of normal. I mean, that's the thing. When, when the sister's describing James Moriarty, she's like, he was a kid. He was like sort of, you know, he was yeah. my brother. He, yeah. he was a little bit of a... He pushed me around every once in a while. Yeah, exactly. But he was just my brother. Well, you know, we're all a product of our choices. Him. And I think right. one of the fun things about going out to the um, schools, which I'm done with now, but I went out for about three weeks, was I was able to sort of, you know, talk to these groups of three and 400 kids and say, you know, it's all about the choices you make. And if you make one or two wrong ones, people start seeing you as that kid. Right. And they just do. They get that And too. then you kind of self-fulfill. Well, if I'm that kid, I'll do something else lousy and something else, and suddenly you're the lousy kid. Right. And it's just so easy to make Make that slip, and that's what James makes. And his sister is going, "Don't do it," yeah. you know. And he's like any typical older brother, saying, "Shut up!" And I know what I'm doing. And yeah, at 14, he knows what he's doing. So, so how do kids respond? So far, as you've been talking to them, how do they respond to the to, to the whole story of Sherlock Holmes? I mean, the, the yeah. Sherlock series on on PBS. Helps. And that's really well. That's really what this is. You know, this is how did how did Benedict Cumberbatch become in the current series, Benedict Cumberbatch. Right. Because it does take place in the present instead of the past. That was a bit of a fight with my publisher. I really wanted to set it in the past. And uh, they kept saying, no, 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 present, present. And I said, but you know. And they said, no, present. And I think it works. I mean, it was, it was a difficult sort of artifice to throw in there, but. Yeah, and um, you said you've been enjoying it. You're in the Oh, oh I now. love writing it. I mean, I love that point of view. You, you have a history I've, of this. I have two daughters, so you know, being a 12-year-old girl, I have watched how the world tortures 12-year-old girls, 13-year-old girls, four, you know, um, that mine are 18 and 19 now, and um, in a way, this is for them, you know, because uh, we we shouldn't, you know, for one thing, that in socially in schools, I don't, do you have kids? Oh yeah, four. Yeah, uh, are any of them into that age yet? Uh, 20, 18, 16, yeah, so 14. Yeah, so you've seen it all too. I shouldn't I mean, have just admitted that. You know, yeah. you know how when they, they're in that middle school, almost high school thing, the girls are way worse than the boys. I mean, socially. They are such backbiters, and they lie to each other. Your best friend will lie to you, and it just crushes you when it they do. It can be very tough. Yeah, it's really yeah. tough. So I just wanted to, you know, sort of give... I, I made Mariah... You know, her own person. She kind of weeds her way through all that junk. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I wanted to show that somebody can survive all this. Do your daughters comment on your... Do they, like, give you any advice or guidance on these characters? They like don't the even read the books. No, some of... <laughs> occasionally they read a book. I, my uh, story, our second daughter, I think has read about one of the books I've read. But she, uh, she helps me in the office, so she knows what I'm up to. And Paige is off at college and doesn't have time to. Yeah, so. I understand yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Do your kids watch any of I your shows? Watch yeah, exactly. Yeah, so. busy. You know how uh, that is. Well, let's talk about White Bone too. I love, by the way, this is like going to be an amazing series. Oh, I, I've I, had so much fun. I'm now, you know, as I say, I literally today I was working here in Miami um, on a polish of this, and it's getting so close. And you get so excited as a writer. This is maybe the fourth, third, or fourth rewrite, um, and you get really excited as it starts to come together. I've cut. 20,000 words out of the first draft by So you by can this come point. to Miami. I mean, we're going to go to White Boat in a sec, but you can come to Miami and work. You can like, oh, be yeah. working well, the book. Oh, yeah. Well, I have to because okay. I write two books a year, sometimes three books a year. Yeah. This last year, three books. And so there isn't, I mean, I, no I was writing eight minutes ago, yeah, you know, no, in the no library across from here. No. Yeah. Well, and I have fun, but yeah. it's not like it's torture. It just has to get done, you know. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, White Bone takes into, uh, it, it's, it's your Risk Agent series, but it's, it's elephant poaching in right. Kenya. And this is something you've been writing about. This is something that means a lot to you. Talk it to me about you know, where I, that came from. Yeah, I, I don't even remember now how I stumbled onto it, but I'm always looking for Risk Agent ideas because he's kind of a born character. He travels all around the world. And uh, I stumbled onto this uh, thing that you probably know, and a lot of people probably know, but I did not, that you know, we're losing 100 elephants a day, and that in now eight and a half years, there will be no wild African elephants left. Your grandkids won't be able to go to Africa and see an elephant in the wild. They might see them in a reserve or something, but not in the wild. And that, the elephant is so iconic to Africa. I, I read this and said, no, that, some, you know, somebody's, this is that fake news stuff or something, that can't possibly be. Uh, and it's true. So I went over to Kenya. I spent uh, almost a month there, three, three plus weeks. 
Um, I, I arrived, five days after I arrived, there was a terrorist bombing in Nairobi in a marketplace that killed 12 and injured wow. 70. And so they shut down some of the things I could do, uh, but not a lot. And I interviewed, I think, 25 people over those three weeks all over the country, went to reserve after reserve, went to, um, you know, a half dozen or more um, NGOs, the charities that are not government funded, uh, that are trying to solve this problem and, and save the elephant, essentially. And the more you spend time with elephants in the wild, and the more you talk to the people trying to help the elephants in the wild, it totally gets into your soul. I mean, it practically makes me, you know, cry sitting here. But because it's just a freaking tragedy. Yeah. And so Whitebone is hopefully a very fast, suspenseful book but it throws one of the characters into the African bush trying to survive, which fascinated me once I got over there. And the other character trying to catch up to whatever she's done to end up there and find her. I think it's a great, the way that you mix in issues that matter to you yeah, and yeah. illuminate a world that maybe people aren't paying attention to as the background of a thriller, of a fast-moving, fast-paced yeah, well, story, but that people can then learn something that maybe actually affects them. And, and pulls in these sort of world... Yeah, those are the books I like. Like when you read a, uh, you know, a John le Carré, not that I'm comparing myself in any way to John le Carré, but um, you will, even though he writes about the intelligence community and all that, you often come to feel, you know, a, a feeling of what it's like to be disenfranchised in Israel or what it's like, you know. Right. He gives you this taste of a different world. Yeah. And Ever since my Bolt books, if, if I can find one, and I don't always, but if I can find a little social issue to base the book around, um, hopefully then it's beyond just an entertaining read, which I hope it is, but you might come away and go, I think I'm going to go Google how to save the elephant, yeah. you know, and send them five bucks. Five dollars goes so far in Africa. You know, if everyone who read that book sent five dollars in, we'd save hundreds of elephants. So, yeah. you know. Who knows? Well, this is the two worlds that you're walking at the same time, right. which is impressive to hear you talk about them both. The schizo. You are in that one so strongly <laughs> in the white bone on the side, in the risk agent side, and yet this, you, you've entered this world too. Yeah, with, I love this world. With the Baskerville Academy in big way too. Yeah, thanks. It's very impressive, Ridley, and uh, I hope that everything continues to keep you as busy as you've always been. <laughs> thanks, Rich. But that you still find time to come see us. Yeah, That's yeah, yeah. Helpful. I'm ever grateful to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Ridley, thanks yeah, for closing out it. Yeah, the show today. Thanks. Folks, this is Ridley Pearson. This book is Lock and Key, The Initiation, the first in a series. There's three.